Hey, Captain, how are you? Good afternoon. Yeah. Nice Great afternoon. to see you. Wednesday afternoon. It's, uh, it's yeah. 25 no. past six. Yeah, it is indeed. We're, um, I'm on holiday at the moment, as I, you will have seen by my new shirt. I didn't notice that. I'm kind of realising that you've got more shirts than, I don't know, than, oh. a, than a, a German street tailor. There we go. How about that? I don't know if you can say that now. But anyway, um, anyway, who have we got on the, on the uh, amazing captain's table today, Rex? Well, well okay. Um, to say this guy, if you couldn't pigeonhole him, would be a massive understatement. Um, this gentleman graduated from the University College Dublin with mm -hmm. the prize uh, of uh, a degree in art history and then a secondary degree in law. Uh, he started working in 1993 uh, for the European Commission for the Russian State Pri uh, Privatization Program, which basically, I think, after he left, it just turned out to be a bit of a carve-out for all of the oligarchs. So I really don't know how that went. Right. That went. It'll be interesting um, to look So at secondly, yeah, no, we'll have a chat about that. Mm. Uh, he's worked for numerous multinationals uh, on many continents, including Pakistan, Shanghai, Thailand, Russia, and the UAE. And um, he's been bombed twice, shot at, mm. and left for dead by a bunch of Chechnyan hitmen uh, in Russia. So right. that's, a, that's a good start. Welcome to the Captain's Table, Pierce Clint. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, guys. <laughs> Welcome, Pierce. This, Thank is, you. this sounds like a spy, star, spy novel. And that I'm interested to hear about. Uh, if I had a dollar for everyone who said that to me, you know, I'd be a rich man today. <laughs> that's for sure. So look, let's let's just get cracking from uh, from uh, early days. Were you a bright uh, bright student, or a bit of a dull mat, or what was the, what was the background going into art history and then law for crying out loud? You know, I you know I got through. Um, I was okay. I certainly didn't excel you know academically. Um, in terms of in top of the class, but you know, is that is that, was that why you studied uh, art history? No, actually, funny enough, that was my choice. <laughs> um, no, I've, I've always had a passion in art. Um, and I think, you know, art, and especially art history, has just, it's such a wide uh, perspective that I, if you understand the art, you know, you have to understand what's happening in history and society, in music and literature, etc. So it was a really, really wide thing. And, I, you know, I've always been pretty artistic. I think, I, you know, I've got, you know, art in the family as well. So art was my, my first choice and, that I and, wanted to do. And presumably after you'd cracked it, you then thought, I know law. <laughs> yeah, funny that. Um, so you finished the art and then moved to law. Did a That's secondary right. degree. Yeah, so oh, I, right. I kind of did art history and philosophy. And when I was mm -hmm. studying philosophy, I studied Aristotelian logic, mm -hmm. um, which I really, really excelled at. I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a big link between our, or sorry, Aristotelian logic and, uh, and law. So it's kind of... I suppose you could say it was an obvious progression. In that sense, the reality was that when I came out of college in uh, in Dublin, there was no jobs. Yeah. We were in the midst of a recession. Yeah. My first choice would have been to become a, a professor and a lecturer in art history, but I knew that there was no way. Well, yeah. was, on the lecturing, by the way. Absolutely, yeah. as a lecturer, yeah. So yeah. there was no way I was going to make that happen. You know, and, and be, yeah, yeah. Right. It was never going to work. Um, so so you know, I, I had to make a crust. Okay, so, I, you know, I working went, went for the European Commission, right? That's right, yeah. So okay. that started off as a three-month gig uh, to go to Russia. Um, so my first job was actually living in Russia uh, for three months in a place called Vologda, about 500 kilometers north of Moscow, uh, the birthplace of Yuri Gagarin, mm. the, uh, the first astronaut in space. Yeah. And I just got such a thrill out of living in Russia. It was just, to me... Because I was a bit of a Russia follower anyway. I'd read a lot of Russian literature in university. You know, I've lived through, you know, the very, very tumultuous times of the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, the Eastern Bloc falling. You know, um, I was in Prague in New Year 1989, just after the Velvet Revolution. Mm -hmm. So the whole dissolution, the fall of the Berlin Wall, that was just really, really impacting, yeah. really impacted on me. Um, and my my view of Russia, I watched the Russians or the Soviets in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They pulled out in eighty nine. Mm -hmm. I was you know all over that back then. So it got the so ball, it got the ball rolling. I, I got the I got the Russia bug, and yeah. then when I went in there for three months. Yeah. Um, so that I, was, sorry, that was ninety three. Uh, yeah, ninety three. Yeah, ninety three. Yeah. So it, it would have been all all goodness of knows what's going on at that stage. Absolutely, it was crazy times. Absolutely you could have. How much could you times. buy a tank for at that stage? 
oh, do you know what? You could get someone killed for, at the time, I think it was about $200. Uh, I don't know, I was never off the tank, but, you know, the hitmen were readily available. So $200 well, we'll, we'll was the we'll price. Well, we'll get to that in due course. Yeah, fine. So, yeah, so basically three months then turned into, yeah, I made a pitch to stay on longer, um, which I loved. Um, yeah. And then I kind of threw any aspiration I had of going back to Ireland and, you know, being a lawyer. Um, I'd kind of made a choice that, this is what I wanted to do was to do the the expat thing um, and to stay abroad. And, you know, I loved Russia. I got a real thrill out of it. So three months you turned pick, into three you, years. You speak Russian? Never learned Russian, but it, kind no of pick, pick, picked it up in the street, you know, okay. speak yeah, at, at my best. Mm. I spoke pretty, you know, reasonable Russian, but with really bad grammar. Mm -hmm. But I could understand, you know, pretty much 90% and I could make myself understood with bad grammar. Right. So... We've got a lot to go through, Chris. Indeed. So, um, so from Russia, working with uh, with the Commission, how long did that last for? And then you got into, well, I say more commercial. Uh, aspects, yeah. Which so, has been a large part of your working life. Indeed. So, the, the as I said, the three months turned into three years, okay. um, and then I spent you know a lot of that living in all over different parts of Russia. Um, and one of my customers, because we were selling state assets, and I was doing a lot of the legal Still stuff. Oligarchs. Well, unfortunately, I was at the very low end of the scale. So we were selling more like factories to the likes of, you know, or trying to sell factories to the likes of, you know, Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, Danone, oh, okay. Biscuits, all those kind of yeah. guys. So I would kind of look at a lot of the, the regional laws and the federal laws and try okay. to kind of put together so that, the investment package. I, I can see exactly how that took you into your role working for a large food manufacturer, which Indeed. is like a global manufacturer. Indeed. And mm -hmm. through that, and was that initially in Russia as well? No, my first day uh, working for Nestle, yeah, yeah. Um, who were a client of mine previously, yeah. was when I landed in Pakistan. Okay. Um, and but that wasn't part of the plan, was it? Well, it was actually it was quite funny because I'd taken a little bit of time off before mm. joining them. And to be honest, with you, I'd kind of gone you know, partying for you know, quite a few months and had traveled a lot around the world. And I remember coming home and there was stickets all over the, the house from my parents saying, you know, Nestle have been calling, you know, so, you know, where have you been? You yeah. know, this is before my mobile telephones. Yeah. So eventually, so I called my father. Uh, you didn't get the message on your page yet? No, no, I didn't have the <laughs> Goodness, goodness, goodness. Sorry. But, you know. I'm sorry. Did you know what a pager is? <laughs> no, if, if you don't just watch a film, it's, uh, it's called The Hangover. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. But I remember calling my father in the office and uh, he said, well, I've got good news and bad news. I said, okay, so, you know, tell me the, the good news. And he said, well, you know, Nestle have called, you know, they've got a, a country, you're ready to go, so you're, you're shipping off and you're, you're, you're going. He's like, okay, great, so what's the bad news? He said, you're going to Pakistan. And I went, Why, what's so bad about Pakistan? And he just said to me, do you remember when we lived in Saudi Arabia? I was like, yeah. And he goes, do you remember there was no bars? There was no uh, socializing, there was no alcohol, there was no parties. He's like, yeah, yeah, he goes, Pakistan's not that different. So that was literally... I bet that wiped as well as your face then, didn't it? Uh, to be honest with you, if the truth was exactly that, it's a very different story. And this because is Pakistan right. was, the expat life, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, Pakistan mm. was phenomenal. Uh, you know, it was you know, very, very sociable. There was just a huge party scene, you know, over there, a huge dinner party scene. It so, was so, so sociable, mm. you were uh, <clears throat> bombed twice there and shot at there? Or not? I can't argue. Yeah, it, yeah. But, well, you know, it was kind of... so. Um, I was there probably a couple of months and it had become a bit of an issue, um, which was well publicized about motorbikes pulling up beside people in uh, traffic lights and uh, shooting them and then, you know, open up. So, so sorry, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the calendar guy. What year are we now? We're now in 1990, uh, Pakistan, 95. 95. Now, when did the Daniel Pearl thing happen Oh, God, that was much later. That was much, much later. Much, okay. much, so, much later. This so was the early days. So this, this, early days. This, this, is, this was when Benazir was, uh, okay. was president. So this is just, Benazir's in charge. That's right. And, and Pierce, just to set this straight, mm. so when, this, when, they're, when, they're, when, they're, when they're popping caps off at uh, mm. people in Gaza, are we talking about people of Western origin? Indeed. Yeah. Well, actually, right. not only that, but you know, they, they had killed uh, a female who was a well-known singer. Um, but people of you know, mainly Western are people who had you know, wealth. Okay. okay, so what they do is they pull up on a motorbike, two people, guy in the back would pull out a gun, <coughs> shoot, you know, whoever's in the car, open up the car door, take your wallet, and then they're gone, right? But for money, as opposed to absolutely. ideological. Oh, no, business. absolutely. It wasn't oh, ideological. Right. It, was it was just pure robbery. It was just pure robbery, right? 
So I was. Why didn't they ask for the wallet? Sorry. You, Sorry. you, you think, <laughs> you know, you think, because honestly, if somebody pulls a gun and says, can I have your wallet? The chances are you'll just say yes. There you go. Sir. Right. But no, it's kind of shoot. And okay. just, they just cut out the middleman, Hammond. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, I was, uh, I was coming home from uh, the office late one night and it was an upper mile. I was on Canal Road and I was at the, the traffic lights on Canal Road yeah, no in one front one. of, yeah. you know, a highway and a motorbike pulled up beside me. And I noticed them, they noticed me, we were looking at each other, and then I noticed the guy in the back of the motorbike reach into his leather jacket, it was winter time, and he pulled out this rather large, kind of dirty Harry style Magnum. gun, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And as he did that, I really, I, I just went into auto, auto mode, and I just put my foot down, and I went across six lanes of traffic, you know, ran a red light, obviously, managed to <coughs> avoid getting hit to the other side of... Uh, Canal Road, and um, the lights were actually, the street lights were off uh, the other side. So it was pitch black. So I was driving, and next thing, you know, the, the shot started. And oh, so they were, they, they were in, in pursuit? They were in pursuit, Excellent. and they, uh, they, they shot the car a number of times, you know, and uh, you know, with an effort to try to shoot me. And I was, you know, luckily, I got home to, I was living in Swedish uh, villas, you know, just behind Main Market, I managed to kind of, you know, get in there. And Did you get, get a get Swedish match ups afterwards? I'll tell you what, I needed one, but unfortunately I didn't. It was Pakistan. Uh, but, yeah. but, so it, it was a purely, it wasn't targeted, they saw you. It wasn't personal. They, they were just driving up, they said, oh, here's one. It wasn't personal. Okay, great. It was just a robbery attempt. Okay. Well, that but would, yeah, that kind of shook. That would be enough to say, I'm out of here. But it wasn't, well, was no, it? it wasn't at all. Um, yeah. And look, that's just, you know, it happens, I suppose. Right. Okay, so then uh, that was in Lahore. And then a couple of months later, I was living in Peshawar up in the Afghan border. Mm -hmm. um, which is beautiful, right? Which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the people, the, the Pathan, Pathan people there are just out of this world. The hospitality. The Khyber Pass, is that near there? Close, close by, okay. close by, up by. Yeah, the, the Khyber Pass was on Hounslow High Street, which was a fantastic curry house he used to go when I was at college. <laughs> I think there's a few in Cobra Pass. There's one in Auckland as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's one in Burr Dubai as well. But, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I was uh, I was up there and I was you know just literally doing a market visit. I was in a, a store kind of downtown and a huge explosion went off and everything crumbled and we were all thrown to the ground. And that wasn't the, the really scary part. But what happened subsequently was that we managed to get up. I was with a, a colleague of mine called Adnan and we dusted ourselves off because all the stores are made of these mud bricks, so it's just everything turns to dust straight away. Can I just interject <coughs> and, uh, and stop you for a second? Just because I want to say stop you for a second because mm. that's going to be quite difficult. Mm. No, um, I'm joking. Um, what I wanted to ask was, uh, this now, of course, was political, was it? Or was it religious fundamentalism? Never, never knew, never knew. There was just a huge explosion. Um, but were there a series there, of explosions? There was, there was no, th that time there was only one explosion, but explosions weren't unusual mm -hmm. you know, at that time. There was a huge amount of issues with Afghan refugees, with kind of struggle for power within, at the time it was called NWFP. Mm -hmm. um, so the, it, was a, it was a turbulent time yeah, yeah. in Northwest Frontier Province. I, re I right? remember hearing about the, the Bhutto documentary and yeah. how, how turbulent it was. It was turbulent, it was turbulent. Yeah. But, you know, it was, you know, I suppose where it got a little bit more hairy was when we managed to dust ourselves off and managed to kind of extricate ourselves onto the street. And we were walking away from where the epicenter of the bomb was. The next thing, um, the shouts start coming, you know, kill the American, kill the American. You and know, you said, where's you know, the American? And literally, yeah, I know, obviously they weren't speaking English, but, you know, I had fairly yeah. decent Urdu at the time. Yeah. Um, Did he manage to flash the Irish passport? Well, funny enough, I was kind of going kill the American, looking for the American, <laughs> you know, <laughs> until I realised that I was the only white guy around. Right. So, and the guy I was with, Adnan, just literally grabbed my hand and he said, "Run!" And we ran, you know, with a a great crowd of people, you know, running behind us in short walk camisas and sandals, um, and managed. Thankfully, we managed to outrun them. Um, to get back to the car. Top tip for those uh, who want to chase after the American, don't have shalwars, camis, and have sandals. And sandals, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I managed to get back to the safety of the car and get out of out of that situation. Wow. That was the shower. And then only a couple of months later, um, I was in Islamabad living there, and it was Moharam, which is you know a religious festival in Pakistan where they... Yeah, they Try they, and kill they, Americans? They, well, no, they, 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 they mourn the death of the grandson of Muhammad, 
Okay. Uh, so it's quite a, it's a very, very emotive time for the, the Shia oh, right, okay. uh, community. And what they do, there's a lot of self-flagellation with I've sh- seen that, chains yeah. and fish knives yeah. where they, you know, they, very, they, they very play similar themselves. to Catholics in, in Southern Europe. Indeed, uh, indeed, uh, indeed, yeah. indeed, yes. So, um, so I kind of passed by the, the procession and with a camera in the car and I couldn't really resist as a young, whatever, 26-year-old or 25-year-old. Mm. You know, I kind of stupidly thought I was like a you know a newspaper a time photographer. Yeah. So the photographs that I took, which are quite amazing photographs, but they start off from a distance, but then I kind of got closer and closer and closer whilst until I got right into the middle of the crowd. So I'm right in the middle of the crowd with you know young kids and blood splashing all over the place as they kind of flay themselves with, you know, fish knives attached to uh, to chains as they kind of smash their backs on this. And I'm taking you know, all these photographs. Sounds like and a yeah, and um, lo and behold, really not a surprise. You know, my naivety and stupidity, the uh, the crowd turned, um, and all of a sudden it was like, you know, was like, here we go again, kill the American. Um, so I kind of had to tail it out of there with an awful lot of very very angry and bloody people, you know, chasing after me, wow. and literally got back to a car, to my car, and had to unfortunately kind of just put the foot down. Uh, with reckless regard for anyone else's safety other than to get out of there because it was very clear I was going to get you, pulled limp from them. Do you think you've ever been so stupid again since then? Um, that's debatable. Okay, <laughs> just, I, just, I just wanted to know if you thought if you had or not. Anyway, so sure. uh, is that, does that cover Pakistan in terms of uh, tales of daring do? And yeah, I think it does. Like, you know, look, you know, let it be said, you know, Pakistan I absolutely love. Of course. You know, and to this day still yeah. have great affinity with Pakistan yeah. uh, and still follow the politics you know, in Pakistan you know, very, very closely. Yeah. But, you know, loved, okay. loved it. Are you still with uh, Unilever at this time? Uh, I was with Nestle. Yes, with Nestle. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was my first country with Nestle. So then, did he start moving around quite a bit? Because I mean, there's, yeah, a, there's yeah. quite a lot to cover here. I mean, there is, Shanghai, yeah. Thailand, Russia again. Well, yeah. The next yeah. next step was uh, from there. Uh, Central Asia was just opening up. Yeah. Um, so, um, as as markets, obviously, you know, they were getting their independence from the former Soviet Union. And, and what are you and what are you doing regionally in these places? Now? Um, well, as, as you know, in, the, yeah, so the, I was the, more kind of, you know, sales, marketing, distribution. Yeah. Um, so kind of leading that um, and then setting up a representative office in, uh, in Uzbekistan, looking after you know, the five countries of the stands of Central Asia. So Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. Is this all kinds of foodstuffs? Drinks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dairy? Every, everything kind yeah. of, you know, coffee, from de- dietetics. Yeah. Um, you know, Culinary, ice cream, you know, be- beverage, yeah. you know, water, okay. you know, etc. The full, full thing. So yeah, pa- you know, spent a couple of years then in Uzbekistan, um, and then obviously in all the other stands, but based myself in Tashkent, which was absolutely marvelous, like mm. one of the most beautiful, beautiful countries and most mm. historic places in the world, um, and really, really enjoyed my time there. Really enjoyed, and met my wife there, um, and really just you know loved it all. But unfortunately. In, I think it was 1999, February 16, if I'm not mistaken, oh, no. there was a coup attempt. The day, so. There was a coup attempt. Mm. Um, so there were kind of fundamental Islamic uh, elements in the, the Fergana Valley, which was, again, heavily influenced what was happening in, you know, other parts of, yeah. you know, kind of we'll say, early Al-Qaeda times. Um, so they decided that they'd try to overthrow the government. Um, so there was six car bombs uh, planted all over uh, Tashkent. Um, so they blew up the airport, the FSB, which is the successor of the, the KGB, so the security services. They blew up the, the National Bank. They blew up the cabinet of ministers. There was a gunfight around the cabinet of ministers. Yeah. All, all yeah. That, but you know, it was all about... All in one t- day. All, all within a couple of hours. Right? Oh. In the morning of the 16th of, uh, mm. of February. And... Um, so the idea was to assassinate the, the president at the time was you know Karimov Islam Karimov, and to take out the full cabinet of ministers, um, and pretty unlucky for Not us. Not the Americans this time. Well, pretty unlucky for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> so pretty yeah. unlucky for us is that the bombers actually uh, had planned it and they lived uh, as neighbours to our office. Um, mm. 
And instead of leaving evidence be behind, they decided that they'd blow up their own uh, their house, uh -huh. which actually then took out our office as well. With all of us in it, right? You know, and including my wife, Lena, who you know, worked, you know, uh, we worked together at the time. So that kind of blew up the office, and then but basically you're like Nestle's answer to Kate Aidy. I was just going to you know, say that in the hotel bar, go, there's always bloody <laughs> trouble. Right. Right. Yeah. Kent's lives are up to three, four, four, four lives so far. It's oh. good. It's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so did you move out then after there? Obviously, no, no, no. I stayed on uh, yeah. there, and then you know subsequently. Uh, so I, I left uh, Uzbekistan in 2000, beginning of 2000. So yeah. I went to at that stage. Did well. I'd, I'd kind of done stints in KL and in Manila yeah. as well during that time, um, but then moved over to Paris for a number of months. Lived in uh, in Paris. It must um, have been quite boring. After it was a bit been... of it was a bit refreshing. Yeah. Um, but actually, it wasn't boring in the slightest because I was there for St Patrick's Day when right. Ireland beat France in the Six Nations. And Brian, right. and Brian, Driscoll, got and Brian and Driscoll got his hat trick. Indeed, yeah, yeah. and I had the pleasure of having my mum and dad over staying with me. For uh, for Paddy's day, so that was pretty special. Um, but you got pretty bombed that night as well, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the different sense, indeed. <laughs> too soon, Rick. Too soon. Too we, soon. We, we definitely enjoyed that one. Um, but then, you know, kind of relatively quickly, then you know, moved over to uh, to Bangkok, um, and with Nestle, with Nestle again, yeah, yeah. So then, kind of, you know, ran a, a regional role for all of Asia, mm. uh, you know, on a particular project there. So kind of did Bangkok for just over a, a year or so. Um, lived in India as well uh, in uh, in Delhi, which was pretty cool, and then moved to Shanghai, um, and then did you know kind of what two and a half years or so in Shanghai, um, where I had the, the pleasure of you know looking after about you know twenty two offices around China. So literally, kind of, I would take a flight on let's say Monday morning. And then I would do a province in Monday. I do a different province on Tuesday, a different province on Wednesday. Right. Come back, and then I have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday back in Shanghai, and then I'd be mm. doing that. So, yeah, that was that was really really great. I um, love that. Okay, so at what stage did you go back to Russia? Because you know, for the last four years, you haven't been your life hasn't been threatened, so it's getting a bit dull for you. Yeah, right? It's getting so, a bit boring, isn't it? So, yeah. uh, you know, when did you move back to to Moscow? So Moscow uh, went back to Russia in uh, 2003. Is it going to get interesting again, Pins? Yeah, unfortunately. And I think really this is what we've all been waiting for. Actually. Still with Nestle, though. Still, Still with, with Nestle, Nestle. yeah. Call back to... So, this, is, this is quite interesting. Yeah, so I, I kind of, you know, so I, I went back into, uh, into Russia um, and... This wasn't involved in the KGB. Much... Much against the, the kind of the advice I, of desire. I was going to say life. let him finish, but if we do that, and we'll be here till like eight o'clock. So. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, kind of went in. I was you know the youngest market head of of Nestle. My I think my ego kind of you know drove you know a little bit of that decision that you know how would I ever turn that down as such a, an accolade, and um, went in there and how would I put it. It wasn't too long after we got there. There was certain things, things were that were a little strange, <laughs> yeah. right? Mm. From some you know, very large acquisition that we'd made. Um, and things maybe had slipped past the audit process, um, et cetera. So we kind of started to address that. Okay, so by addressing that, I pretty much cleared out you know, the... You all know, the suppliers, all, all the owners, well, all pretty the much contracts. everybody, all the staff, most of the staff, top management, etc., etc. Um, and the, the same day, I'm sensing something. Yeah, the same day, then mm. you know, uh, an army of you know, Godzilla personal bodyguards turn up. Okay, were they from a particular region? Mm -hmm. Well, no, the the bodyguards were her all ex military. Mm. But what we found out that actually what we had to deal with was, um. Chechens, yeah. okay, oh, oh, and, and yeah. similar to a mafia type organization. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So yeah. they they pretty much control the wholesale market, uh, okay. and as I said, there was the a, hotel market. No, the wholesale. Oh, wholesale, yeah, right, sorry, right, sorry, right through sorry. Russia. And right. the previous owners of this particular company had, uh, let's say, a, a special arrangement. Okay, uh, with them, uh, which which you'd driven a truck through, basically. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And look, yeah, this came from the, the ruble, the Russian ruble crisis, where mm. you know, they were trying to sell the company. 
to mm. Nestle, um, and they had made some kind of you know, unsavory arrangements, uh, which you know, we then figured out. But that obviously then, as you say, you, I drove a truck through that. And, and this then was became, pretty much a personal thing as opposed to a whole entity. It's, it's you. Yeah, no, no, I was yeah. the I was the MD, so therefore you know, the book stopped with me, and I was the one who kind of stopped you know all this stuff going on. So therefore, I was the target. And, and obviously, there was a bit of uh, some covert messaging or overt, you know. Oh, it was very overt. Yeah. Uh, they were very clear. So they had code names for, uh, at the time, my, my daughter, Shauna. She was the, the brat. Uh, my wife, Lena, was the bitch. Um, Dealing with yeah, a nice crowd so, there. Then, yeah, yeah, they were lovely. Yeah. They were very savoury. Yeah. Um, and we would get text messages. This and, so, and how did it start off? With through messages? Yeah, yeah, it was text messages. Te- te- text messages. Yeah. Because this was before smartphones. It was the old Nokia phones. Yeah. So it was just text messages. Um, they did all sorts of ter- terrible things. You know, they, they advertised uh, my wife, Lena, in the uh, newspapers as a, as a prostitute. So we'd get you know, on, our, on our home number as well. So people would call our home number in the middle of the night. You know, looking for a bit of action. You know, just to make your life so difficult, you'd leave. Yeah, yeah, and they Basically. they kind of they followed us around. We got right. photo, I got photographs in the post of you know you know my family members. So Jeepers. we had twenty four seven. So I was going to say, so it, it, it then geared up really quickly. Well, it geared up very very quickly, and we we had armed twenty four protection on both myself, uh, Sean, who was in kind of preschool at the time. So we'd have like a great Godzilla, you know, standing in the classroom or in the the schoolyard. Same with Lena, she would go shopping with her friends, you know, and there might be you know, a great big Godzilla, mm. you know, five meters behind and literally everywhere I went, mm. there was a, you know, an armed guard, you know, everywhere we went. Um, and we, we took the usual precautions. So, you know, no routine. So we left at a different time, you know, took a different route to the office, came back at a different time, different routes. So absolutely no routines whatsoever. And how long did this go on for? Pretty much? Uh, about two years. Cheap. Yeah. 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 But, and, how did it kind of manifest itself? Because obviously, I'm, I know the outcome of the story, but just um, maybe you can give us a little insight to what happened. And because it's a fundamental and major part of your life. Yeah, well, look, you know, I, I, look, you know, at, at the end of the day, as I said, you know, I suppose the fact that I'm Irish and I'm stubborn, you know, I kind of thought that's you know, stupid, that's stupid, possibly. Yeah. But I thought to hell with this, you know, they're they're not going to get away with this. Yeah, you know, right. I'm going to stand for my principles yeah. of what's yeah. right, etc. Um, but yeah, we used to walk around with. You know, business class tickets for Air France and Lufthansa everywhere we went because they had flights on successive days. And there was there were occasions where I just literally have to call in and say, listen, no matter where you are, right, go to the airport and leave. Right. And yeah. um, so I got them out of the country a couple of times um, because, you know, things were getting a little hairy. Yeah. Um, um, so we, we kind of lived that life, I for suppose, two for, for two years. Yeah, wow. which, kind of, which is kind of tough. Um, and I think... You know, at the end, there was, and keep in mind, every single moment of every single day, there was somebody probably within 10 feet of you know, myself, Shona, Lena, carrying a gun, right? Every moment of every day, right? As protection. As protection, right? Um, and it so happened after two years for particular, you know, circumstances that there was 45 minutes. You took your eyes off the ball. 45 minutes. I told my bodyguard, you know, that, you know, he was fine. I was okay. You were out he, he socializing with some friends. I was out yeah. socializing with some friends. Yeah. And I said, listen, you're fine. It's okay. We had an argument. He wouldn't let me, you know, be alone. I said, listen, you're absolutely fine. It's okay. Go. Um, and this was traveling out of, out yeah, of we Moscow, were just, just outside. Yeah, yeah, we weren't far outside Moscow. Um, but I was with some, some friends. And, uh, yeah, as I said, 45 minutes. And, uh, yeah, that's all it took. Well, you say that's all it took. I mean, I, it's very, I'm waiting for a to be. I'm waiting for a to be continued. So, when, what, you what so you, exactly. So you weren't shot and you weren't bombed. No, but you were in a public place. I was in a public place, and they put it this way: they Bar, did, they, 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 they did more than they needed to to leave me dead. They filled I, you I, in. I was, I was, oh I was, my I was, goodness! I was very, very lucky. Very, 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 very lucky to, uh, you, to survive you, and to to be able to walk again. Head was smashed in. And you really remember nothing about it, of course. No, no, not at all. Not so, what was the outcome of that? Do you want to go into a little well, bit? Well, there was just a little bit. Of, you know, I, I don't want to get into too much detail no. on it, but you know, obviously, I couldn't leave. Uh, I couldn't get Maddie Vecked out uh, straight away because I had brain swelling. So I was in the European uh, Medical Center in uh, in Moscow, um, and I was doing you know CAT scans and you know on a 
on a daily basis to see when the brain swelling would go down. Um, and eventually when it did, then I got maybe back out uh, and I went back to Dublin and then went literally into Beaumont Hospital. And you were hospitalized for how long? Oh, look, you know, I was, I was an outpatient, I was treated as an outpatient. Um, but, you know, yeah, it took you know, quite a few months to kind of re, re get, get the wires working again. And yeah, yeah, talking about wires working, I mean, you know, you got the million dollar smile now, haven't you? Because you had a whole load of reconstruction. Yeah, I had a bit yeah. of reconstruction going on, but, you know, kind of you know, short term memory loss and, you know, stuff like that as well. So and traumatization of course, yeah. PTSD, all of that. A little bit of that as well. And you've talked about it, and, it, you know, when, when we're having beers over it, and you embellish it a, mm. a little bit more, but you've never really touched on how. And I never really thought about the, the trauma that's attached to that and how difficult that must have been to get over. That certainly would have been the end of your Russian experience, I'm pretty sure. Well, it's not the last time I've been in Russia. I've been in Russia many times since then. No, but um, um, you'd, you'd think that obviously but, everything is off once they've done their trip. Yeah, gone. look, you know, to be honest with you, I, I think you know, it's fair to say that I'd um, when that happened, I kind of lost my bottle for uh, my desire for travel and adventure. No, sure. um, <laughs> so we, we moved, you know, quite abruptly, we kind of moved back to Ireland. And you know, bought a house and settled down and said, "Okay, right, this is you know, this is it. This is so right. we'll just take the the nice easy life from mm. uh, from here." Mm. And that lasts. Did you buy a cardigan or? Uh, no, 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 no slippers. Um, but you know, having said that, as I said, you know, the easy life and the, the kind of the Irish way. You know, I think about within about two years, you know, the itchy the, the itchy yeah, feet yeah. started yeah. coming sure. again. I understand. And you said, "I want to go to the next thing." And. Does that yeah. lead us to this part of the world? It does indeed. It does indeed. Um, and, and thank goodness, and, because and, and, this and is called Dubai Stories. It is. I'm starting to get a bit worried. Yeah, no, I was breaking into a cold sweat. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, you were working with Dell for a very long time. Yeah, so I uh, I joined uh, joined Dell in Ireland, um, Dell Technologies, which was, you know, again, a, a complete right turn, mm. um, which a very old... A uh, wise man called David Ead, who, God rest his soul, is, is, he's left now. But he said, every 10 years, you take a right turn. Do something completely different in your life. So I've kind of tried to follow that yeah, you know, that rule a little bit. Um, so I, I went... Not, not get your face caved in, or no. get shot, <laughs> or get yeah. bombed. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, so I went from kind of, you know, art to law, law to, uh, you know, to Russia doing you know, yeah. privatization stuff, that into FMCG, FMCG, then I decided to go into tech. So, you know, tech then became the, the thing for the next, you know, 16 years. Um, so, as I said, you know, started in Ireland and then moved over to uh, Dubai. Um, Dubai was really important for us, I think, as a, as a family. Um, we were very, very, very keen to bring up our kids in a very multicultural environment. Um, having you know, done the expat thing for what 13, 14 years you know, previous to that. Um, and we just, we, we saw Dubai as this amazing place of tolerance, of multiculturalism, of you know, the melting pot of all nationalities, mm -hmm. all coming together into this really cool society where everyone just you know, gets along well together without prejudging. Yeah. You know, stuff that. And we wanted our kids to, to have that mm -hmm. That experience. We also wanted our kids to be able to have a little bit kind of the expat thing as well by saying that you're not necessarily tied to any one place, but you yeah. can literally hold the globe in your hand, yep. spin it, and just go, I want to go there, and feel that they have the, the ability you know, in every way to yeah. just be who they want, where they want, anywhere in the world, and to hold the world in their hand. And I think Dubai, you know, kind of offered a lot of that. And mm. to be honest, it's a beautiful place, and the weather's great most of the time. So and you know, there are certain tax advantages as well. There are certain tax there. advantages yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we we moved over here, um, you know, fourteen years ago, um, and then you know, got back on the on the road. So I ran the Middle East for a while. I mean, mm. wide catchment area, right? Yeah, yeah, wide yeah. catchment area. So Middle East initially, and then you know, emerging markets. Uh, which went right across uh, Middle East, Africa, Turkey, Central Eastern Europe, Russia, etc. So Russia became part of my territory again. So I was back into into Russia again. Um, so that's magnetic, you know, force that keeps dragging me back there. Um, and you know, and enjoyed you know my time you know doing that. And then ran all of EMEA and then global. Mm -hmm. So kind of you know, again, you know, 
I suppose, you know, utilizing my experience of you know, wandering around, you know, Asia as well as I spent a huge amount of time in Western Europe, you know, as well as then going everywhere from really from China to you know to the US. And Eighteen I, I years with Dell. Sixteen, 16. 16 years with Dell. Yeah, mm-hmm. so you know, really phenomenally good, and mm-hmm. you know, fourteen of which were based here in uh, in Dubai. Um, so you know, a, an awful lot of travel. So mm-hmm. probably fifty percent of my time, you know, I spend you know, out of Dubai and the rest yeah. of the world yeah. and then Singapore, 50% for of the time. Yeah. Indeed, yeah, where I met your wife yeah, and, uh, right. you yeah. know, we had a, and they had, you know, um, a good they night out. Had, had a sociable time in the evening with a friend of hers. Indeed. Um, anyway, not off, uh, enough about that, but more about you. And let's, let's talk about Dubai and where you are now, what you're doing. Actually, what we always tend to do, and you've touched on it, is um, say, what are the good things that you love about Yeah, Dubai? what's, what's yeah. you know, what's... I think you you did touch on it a lot with, with your reasons there, but you know what what's and probably the same things the reasons that you remain here, and and why you love this place so much. Look, yeah, I, I think after fourteen years, you know, Dubai is very much part of our you know our long term plan. Sure. You know, we feel very very comfortable here, and it's home. Mm-hmm. You know, even though you know my wife is from Uzbekistan, mm-hmm. so she's Russian from Uzbekistan. You know, Sean, our eldest, was born in Thailand, has lived in India, China, Russia, whatever. You know, and the other, the, 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 the other two were born yeah. in Ireland yeah. and uh, okay. and are uh, you know lived pretty much all their lives here. Um, so it's very much home. Um, so you know, certainly the the plan would be that we will always maintain a base mm. here in uh, in Dubai. I think you know, we'd we'd like to kind of have a you know second base maybe in in Ireland. Yeah. You know, to spend a bit of time in Europe and then a bit of time here, but. Yeah, I think that the whole Dubai experience has been really good to us, um, and you know, long may it last. You know, we 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 love it here, and I think we love the the openness of it. I think yeah. you know, the, the the friendships that we've built here have been you know amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the opportunities, you know, and the opportunities, and and, and look, you know, and again, and I know you kind of you said you want to get into the the next steps, but I also think that there's. Dubai is a place of amazing innovation and creativity, mm. okay? And not only from you know, a government perspective, but I think that trickles down all the way down mm. to the individual. So, you know, so we're spending, you know, you know, I'm spending an awful lot of time now doing kind of, you know, investment stuff, um, you know, as I've now decided to pursue, you know, a more a different path, yep. you know, so I've kind of finished up with, uh, with Dell and mm. I'm kind of just, you know, pursuing my own personal yep. interests at this stage. Um, but within that, for sure, the opportunities that present themselves here in Dubai, you would never get visibility to yeah. those kind of, and they're, they're global opportunities. Okay, they really are global. It's, it's such a similar story we hear from so many people that sit in the seat. I'm sure, I'm sure. Because yeah. it, it's, it, it's true. And I, yeah. you know, if you click into it, and if you can get into well, it's it. It's a very rich team of it's uh, absolutely yeah, yeah, it's uh, fantastic. Of, of talent and source of, of great stuff. We've always talked about. Mm. The two degrees of separation, yeah. mm. of Dubai as opposed to six, is it or seven elsewhere? Yeah. It's uh, yeah. it's extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And if, if you, if you look, the time you invest over here is the time that you, the, what you get out of it. So Absolutely. 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 And, and look here, honestly, you know, if you're not loving Dubai, you know, this, you know, maybe. Maybe the the hills of Tuscany are beautiful, and you want to go hill walking all day yeah. long, which we can't do here. Mm. But it does mean you you can't do that in exactly. you know, summertime, and then still have your winters here. Yeah. So you know yeah. the long the long term plan is definitely to have your know, winters on here. Yeah. You know, obviously we've got Rory and Chloe, yeah. so you know they've Rory's just finished his GCSEs, yeah. so you know very very proud of him. He's absolutely smashed it. You know, Chloe is absolutely smashing it. She's a brilliant ballerina. You know, but you know she's decided that she's going to stay here and kind of not pursue ballet despite her getting offers from you know some of the most amazing you know the best schools in the world to pursue her ballet career but you know it's it's very much it's a family place that Mm. is very much close to to our hearts and long may it last as i said brilliant well that's a great way to wind up isn't it it's a great story it did have all the and now we could have we could be talking about hours on this and maybe we have to get you back on to go on a bit deeper but thanks for opening up so much because i've Wow, it's, a, it's it's I mean, it's pretty hard to sort of say all those changes that you've had. But thank you so much for the so, to Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure, guys. Thanks for joining the table, mate. Yeah. Pleasure. Uh, today on the Captain Stable, we have an Irishman who's known for talking a lot. I'm actually going to ask him and see if he can give me one-word answers. Can you do that? 
I, I can try. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Again, did, you go, did you go to UCD? Yes. Have you got two degrees? Yes. Were you bombed, shot, and left for dead by the church in the mafia? Yes. Are you going to hear your first one word answers almost by Piers? Great chat with Piers today. I tell you what, I've certainly learned a few things. Rex? Yeah. Piers, what do you think? Loved it. Thank you very much, guys, for having me. It's been a real pleasure. I'm a big fan of the captain's table, so I'm honored to be, to be here. Great. So if you want to hear more of these great stories, like, comment, YouTube.